Hi, I'm Chris Fitzgerald, and thanks as always for joining me for the Jazz Bass Video Technique Series. This installment focuses on right-hand pizzicato technique and features 10 guest bassists who have generously shared their time um, to put forth their ideas and their concepts of how they get a sound with the right hand on the bass. You'll be hearing from um, <laughs> A bunch of really really great bassists among them i'm going to try and remember all the names because there's so many rufus reed lynn seaton david friesen marco panacea tyrone wheeler rich armandi bob Sinecrope, doug elmore ray parker and emma dayhuff um, many of these segments were filmed at the abersold summer jazz workshops but some of the people um, sent their segments in both their playing segments and their teaching segments in from the locations wherever they were. Uh, three of them I think came from New York. So I'm especially grateful to those people for taking the time to not only share their knowledge but also film themselves sharing their knowledge. This is going to be a really really long video so I highly suggest everybody use the indexing feature uh, right underneath the YouTube window so that you can uh, go right to the spot for the player you want to hear at that time. One thing I would like to say, and I will keep this beginning segment short, one thing I would like to say is that um, if nothing else, um, the people in this video demonstrate that there are a lot of different ways to do the same thing and sound great doing it. In other words, um, it's really easy when you are sort of in one small corner of the universe, of the base universe, um, to be fed information that there is one right way and one wrong way, sorry, one right way and many wrong ways to do something. Um, but my experience has been that when you get out there in the world, you will see players sounding absolutely amazing using all sorts of different techniques. And so rather than decide that a technique is bad and that that will never work. I've always found it more useful to go out and listen to great players sounding great and if there's something that they have, something that they're doing, that I can put to use myself and make me a better player, then I'm absolutely going to do that. So this video is dedicated to that idea. Um, I will be the very last person presenting on this video because I already have a number of videos in this series about right hand technique, but please enjoy the presentations from all these wonderful bassists and thank you to all the contributors uh, contributors to this episode. I'm really grateful that you took the time to share your knowledge and I'm pretty sure that the people who watch the video will be too. Hi, I'm Rufus Reed, and I want to talk about what I do with pizzicato technique with, with my right hand. Um, as you all probably know, uh, there's just so many different ways to play pizzicato, but this is the way that I do it, and this is how I learned, and it's been very helpful for me, and hopefully it will be for you. Um, I use my arm a lot to help me uh, pull the string. Uh, unlike classical music where you would have, a, you actually pluck the string. Uh, and when we play jazz, we have to actually pull the string so that we can actually feel that energy. Uh, if And I use my arm 
maybe just to start using maybe like a make your finger appear to be like a hook and you want to pull so I'm actually pulling this and if you can see that I'm pulling the A that's a really loud note if I were to play it but so I have the control with my arm and I think probably one of the most important things is that we have a good pulse because it's only us to play in a group so one bass so our pulse has to be pretty good because we have to be able to uh, this is where it is folks and everyone including the drummer will come to it if you're strong and consistent with it so uh, just like a preparatory like if a conductor gives you a one two three and play so I'm doing this one, two, three, and play, and play, and pull, and pull, and pull, and pull. Whether on the D string, pull. As opposed to just doing this with the finger. The finger is only so strong, so if you could actually employ the arm, you'll have a lot more depth in your sound. Just check this out. With my arm it has more depth it's very subtle and yet it's pretty huge when you put it all together so I'm going to uh, start with the D string and one and two and three and four not this one because I think visually your pulse is important as well as what they're hearing. So one, two, three, and one, A. G. I don't like the way it sounds so you have to listen to all that so and then you control dynamics because we should be able to play dynamically we yes we play with amplifiers but that should only be enhancing your sound not be your sound so here you have the weight Now what I also do quickly is, if you have a bow, you have a down bow and up bow. So here's the down stroke bits and the up bow. Um, and this way I can play faster. As opposed to trying to play all down strokes because this muscle gets tired. We can't get tired. So we need to find something that oscillates. So I'm uh, moving, moving, and yet I have control. And that's the beginning. Thank you.
Seton. I teach at the University of North Texas, and I'd like to share some thoughts about right-hand pizzicato with you. My default mode is what I call the wave. That's where all four fingers are used to produce the sound, and I wave just like that at the bass. Start with your hand relaxed to your side. Notice that your hand is open, the fingers are curved. Then you bring it over and, oh, I happen to bump into a bass. But my hand is still open. There's space here. It is not flat against the fingerboard. It is open this way. My thumb is on the side of the fingerboard. And I pluck this way. This gives a lot of meat to pluck the notes. Notice that my knuckle plays a part in this. The D string is on this side and the A string is on this side as I pluck the G string. I start in the air, plucking the string, moving through the string hitting the fingerboard and coming to rest on the string below. This works with one finger. It works like Ray Brown did, where he has pinky extended. And with two, but I'm not plucking with two, but just the motion. Some people's fingers work differently, just like some people can do this, live long and prosper, and other people cannot. It just depends upon how you're comfortable, whether you want to do the way with all four fingers, with one finger, like this or like this, but only the first finger is used to produce the sound with this technique. As I move to the D string, then my knuckle moves over, so it's between the E and the A string. You can hear that nice thump. Then when I go to the A string, the knuckle is here with only the E string on this side. The E string is a little bit different. Because I have nothing to rest against, this is the motion. You almost can imagine you're starting a car, turning a key. So when I walk across some different strings, the main technique that I use called the wave. Three, four. See, my fingers are pointed this way, kind of like a peace sign. It starts with the same relaxed hand with the same open shape. I put my finger on the side of the fingerboard and I alternate my fingers. Once again, I'm starting in the air. I'm not starting on the string. And notice that always when I pluck, one finger is up and one is down. very relaxed and easy on the tendons that your fingers are free to move. So when I play this way, one finger is up, one is down, passing through the string, hitting the fingerboard, coming to rest on the string below. As I move to the D string, again I close my hand up, leaving my thumb there. Again, the E string is slightly different. I don't have a string to rest upon, but it will come and hit my thumb. I've discovered that some great records, I've heard sometimes you hear a finger snap, and that means that you're doing this right. You might do that. I'm exaggerating how much it snaps right now, but it is what happens. So, alternating as I ascend on a C major scale, come down, notice that I'm already set up 
so I rake. Just like you would rake leaves. Your finger has already played this note and it's all ready to go for the next note. So ascending, alternate all the way. and you just heard me play uh, the blues and I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, the sound um, how I think about it uh, what I think uh, how you can get the best sound for me the sound happens in the left hand specifically um, I like to milk the note and give it its full value so I get a real kind of legato feeling to the blues line because jazz is that way. Jazz has this forward motion. If it's if it's too thumpy like that, it becomes very vertical, and you don't get that forward. That's why people, when they skip a rock across a lake, uh, they love the feeling of that skipping, and that's how I like to think of jazz. So I try to get that. thinking about milking each and every note as long as I can. Um, for instance, if I'm playing an, an, an F and the line is a line like that, I hold the F for two beats, grab the tenth for one beat, instead of I go that way I get a sustain, and that sustain helps create that forward motion. Um, about the right hand pizzicato, you know, the, the further down you are, not into the rosin obviously, but the further down you are at the end of the fingerboard, the bigger the sound. There's just no doubt about that. I'm not applying any more pressure, it's just that when I'm pizzicatoing down towards the end of the bridge, you just get a bigger sound. So um, I'm looking for that uh, large sound, but also that sustain, which for me all happens right here in, in the left hand, getting the full value of uh, each and every note. And so that's, that's uh, how I think about it. And I could go into more detail perhaps, but I think that, that gives you a, a panoramic view of, uh, yeah, of, how I approach, how I approach this. Thank you. Four.
Hi everyone, my name is Marco Panacea and uh, I'm a bass player here in New York City and I want to thank Chris Fitzgerald for inviting me to be part of this video about uh, right hand technique, you know, especially when playing a walking bass line. Um, well, uh, I would say that the way that I play uh, has sort of evolved naturally from many years of playing and uh, and through the advice of many teachers, great teachers that I've had, like Ron Carter, I think there are a lot of influences uh, from his approach in my playing. I think that's probably why I keep these two fingers kind of like this, you know, instead of having like an open hand, I generally uh, keep them like this, you know, because during our lessons he would have me hold a, a cork from a wine bottle. So I guess I don't, I'm not holding the cork anymore while I'm playing. But um, I guess that kind of stuck with me. And that's the approach that I use these days. Um, I would say that uh, the way I play like, has all to do with, uh, uh, with the sound that I want to achieve. So I try not to get too academic about it. I just basically do whatever it takes to get the sound that I want. And for me, uh, I would say that uh, the most important aspect uh, to keep in mind is to try and play really at the end of the fingerboard because um, you really get a, a more mid-rangey tone that's really, really useful, especially when, uh, when playing with a loud drummer. Sometimes, you know, we, as bass players, you know, we kind of buy into the idea that it's all about having a big, huge acoustic sound, but I think that even more important than that is the ability to make yourself heard and felt and that has a lot to do with uh, the type of sound that you produce and uh, it's very important to have this added mid-range and generally playing at the end of the fingerboard really helps with that process so if I compare this like play, playing the same thing up here there's not enough bite but here So that's something that I always keep in mind. To me, it's sort of like having a, uh, an imaginary mid-range button, like a knob here on the bass, you know, that I kind of activate, you know, the more I play towards the end of the fingerboard. And I think this is the school of playing, you know, that, um, that goes back to, you know, the great Ray Brown and Ron Carter and Christian McBride. And uh, I think that a lot of Ron's students have a... Uh, piece of Velcro, like placed here uh, at this spot on the side of the fingerboard to remind you that you have to kind of keep your, your thumb, you know, that anchors, you know, that's anchored here, that you have to keep it towards the end of the fingerboard. The Velcro will kind of reveal if you're tending to go a little more like north on the fingerboard. So it's a very useful thing to have, you know, that's worth keeping on the base for like a year or so just so that you could really get used to this. And um, something else I want to mention is uh, the, uh, I basically agree with a lot of the things, you know, that, uh, that Chris Fitzgerald says in his videos. I mean, I wouldn't want to repeat his concepts, you know, but I really agree with pretty much everything he says as far as uh, using a lot of meat on, on the string, I mean, the, basically trying to place the whole finger on the string as opposed to having a more electric bass like kind of approach with this. And really trying to plug this way using as much of the finger as you possibly can. And, uh, and also, it's very important to just be very relaxed and try to transfer the whole weight of your arm like this right on the string and try to concentrate all your strength to to the tip of your fingers kind of like really trying to relax your arm as much as possible and trying to transfer all the the strength you know that comes from this part of the arm just trying to transfer it to this side of the uh, this part of the finger
much it and uh, I really appreciate you listening to this and uh, thanks again to Chris for uh, inviting me to be part of this and I hope you enjoy the rest of the presentation. Thanks a lot. Hi, my name is Tyrone Wheeler, uh, bassist from Louisville, Kentucky, and welcome to the Chris Fitzgerald bass topic, and today's topic is right hand techniques, the way that I like to play or recommend a good starting point positioning of the right hand on the double bass. Uh, the first thing that I try to keep in mind is using a nice amount of the flesh of the finger in order to help get a nice warm sound, uh, and I also try to use the weight uh, of the arm uh, to help. Uh, the way that I like to approach it, uh, if the tempos are not too fast, uh, I try to play a lot with one finger. For instance, and then uh, with variations, of that technique, uh, if I have a faster rhythmic passage, sometimes I will alternate the fingers in order to help. Well, that's one of the things that I like to do. Uh, for solo passages uh, and faster, maybe faster rhythmic passages or melodies, uh, oftentimes I like to alternate the fingers of the right hand. You know, there's a couple of the things that I do for faster tempo playing. Uh, I love the sound of one finger, but I uh, get tired. My arm or hand will get tired for long periods of time if I try to play faster tempos for long periods of time. So I alternate between alternating two fingers and one finger techniques in really fast tempos. It's basically pretty much the ways that I do it. Sometimes I occasionally use uh, what I like to call a, maybe a, a Ron Carter sweeping right hand technique where the two fingers are kind of placed together. Sometimes that kind of pretty much it uh, with the right hand also sometimes I like to experiment with playing double stops when using double stops I will oftentimes uh, if I'm focusing on playing intervals of tenths uh, where on the E string I'm playing the root note and on the top string I'm playing the third of the chord maybe major third or minor third 
Oftentimes I'll use the thumb and the index finger. I have to use those, that technique sometimes with the right hand. Uh, I believe that's about it, the way that I approach uh, with the right hand. Hi, I'm Rich Armandi uh, from Chicago. I play the bass, obviously. I also play the tuba, but that's a, for another video. Um, I want to thank Chris Fitzgerald for inviting me uh, to uh, participate in this project. And uh, I want to share uh, something about how I approach the, uh, uh, the right hand uh, articulation on the bass for jazz playing. Um, and actually, I, I'll have to... Uh, admit up front that this is actually not from me but rather from the great Larry Gray who if you don't know of him check him out brilliant wonderful musician and a great teacher too but anyway uh, as you saw in the video uh, I I probably use several different ways of articulating the string I'm, and I'm an, a big advocate of doing whatever you need to do at the time you need to do it because this is a bear of an instrument in many ways and just drawing the sound out can be challenging. Uh, I think what's most important beyond the physical is the concept that you bring to the instrument and I, I try to be hearing every note that I play the way I'm delivering it. So with that in mind uh, I, I want to talk about uh, Larry Gray's uh, methodology. Anyway, he hit me to what he calls string grabbing. And uh, the benefit of this is that you can develop a wonderful, consistent sound uh, regardless of the uh, dynamic you must play. So I'll just do it on the D string for now. It's basically grab the string, pull it, and, and it, then it remains stationary, release. Then the the uh, dynamic level is then a function of how far you pull the string. Okay, grab, release, grab, oops, sorry, one, and uh, if we practice this in a rhythmic way, one, and, two, and, one, and, whoops, darn it. <laughs> Also, uh, and we should practice it with two fingers. One and two and one and two and. Notice I, this from here out, out uh, the maximum um, uh, uh, extension of the finger to pulling, grabbing the string and pulling it uh, to its spot where it's going to be stationary. That's all one motion. too. Once it's stationary, it's stationary. It's not wiggling around. I don't pull it again. Uh, but like I said, if, if you only pull it a short distance, whoops, again, you can, you can develop a, a consistent sound, uh, regardless of the dynamic. It works great on electric bass too for you 
electric bass players. So anyway, uh, when I'm playing though, I really don't think about that stuff after all that. Uh, I, I also on upright try to uh, actually not utilize the finger so quite so much. Rather, I let the finger uh, be a part of the the bigger structure of the arm and and pull the um, pull the string more from back here than anything in order to get a nice big rich sound with a minimum of work. So. Um, and of course, keep the uh, keep the arm relaxed and straight, more or less. Pull it towards the end of the fingerboard for uh, the greatest possible sound. Of course, we can play in other parts of the bass for different sounds, different requirements, ballads, etc. Uh, what I was saying before about using all kinds of ways. Sure, I, I sometimes use two fingers this way. Use two fingers this way. Uh, Play like Ray Brown this way, and every any any way you can get the job done uh, with a great sound is, I think, the right way. So I hope uh, I was able to share something with you that you can take from this video. And I, I again thank Chris Fitzgerald for allowing me to be a part of this. I'm here to talk about right hand technique for the double bass. Um, um, one of the things that I like to think about is getting, first of all, uh, I think of a letter C actually in both hands and I want to come to the bass like this and like this. Uh, but when I come here like this, I don't want to have my hand, I know some guys do it, but I don't like to have my hand like this because I feel it weakens. So I like to kind of pretend I can hold a pencil and have my finger out here kind of like a captain hook if you will and then I like to play rest strokes and a rest stroke is when you go through the string and the next string catches your finger and ends it as opposed to free strokes which uh, don't have the oomph um, if I really want to propel the band um, ignite the band then I want to come through the string quickly uh, the quicker the attack the more explosive I feel like the bass line can be. If I want to play something that's more gentle, or maybe playing in two, uh, um, then I might do um, a little bit gentler attack so the thing doesn't come out and, and want to make you get up and dance, it, it, but it wants to move you still. It still needs to have a center. Um, I generally favor playing with one finger at a time. Uh, I can play with two fingers at a time, but I find the sound, the sound is more consistent if you use one finger, so um, it's a small thing, but the difference between ordinary and extraordinary is something a little extra. Love is in the details. I couple that with, um, especially if I'm walking with um, my left hand, oh, it's almost like I'm playing basketball. I'm going to exaggerate. This isn't what I do, but it gives you an idea. note will naturally die if you leave it. I don't want the note to die. I want to be in control of having the note fade out. So I'm going to put a little daylight by lifting my left hand fingers up so I'm in control of when that string, uh, when the sound ends. Um, 
and I feel like that gives it a lot of lift. I like to think about putting air in the line. So this is the, you know, the igniter. This gets the thing going. As opposed to... I was trying there to keep the notes running into each other, and I found that that little bit of air really helps uh, the line pro uh, propel. Um, so that's it. Best of luck. I'm Doug Elmore, and I'm going to talk a little bit about sound production on the double bass when you're playing a jazz pizzicato. Now, one of the first things I try to tell people when I'm talking to them about this is the left hand is a little bit involved in this. You must have the string firmly anchored to the fingerboard to get any kind of sustained sound, because if the left hand's not firm, you, you'll never get that beautiful, long, connected legato that you want. And that comes from relaxing the left hand and pulling into the fingerboard when you play. So that's the left hand part of the equation. The right hand part, which is what everybody tends to focus on, for me is driven by the tempo of the song, the style of the song, the speed and velocity of the notes that you're playing yourself. If I'm playing a ballad with players and I want the longest ringing sound I can, I'll set the hand almost at the edge of the board and I'll pull with as much meat of the index finger as I can, and I'll do it by relaxing and letting the weight of my arm fall into the next string down. So everything is a function of the weight of my arm falling into the string. Now obviously you might say, well the E string has no bumper at the end, so I just fall off the instrument. And again, there she should have that feeling of your arm falling through. For those of you that are orchestra guys, a lot of us were trained as children that our pizzicato pulls away from the bass. For most of us that are playing in a jazz context, think of pulling into the fingerboard. Your finger will actually bang against the fingerboard to one extent or another. So for long duration notes, I'm near the end of the board, I get as much of the meat of my index finger involved as I can, and I almost never use my second finger in slower tempos. It's all index finger driven. Now when you're walking lines, if it's a reasonable tempo, I still try to use the only index finger, unless you get into falls or when you're doing what David Baker used to call a rake across the strings, I'll try to set my first finger and so that you still have that meat of the first finger falling into the string. As the tempo accelerates, I tend to move to a two-fingered still a lot of pull involved, but hand strength becomes part of the play because the faster the, the tempo is, the more economical you have to be with how much body is involved in this. It's like when you see a violinist playing really fast 16th notes in Tchaikovsky, you don't see their entire bow arm working, you see this really minimalistic wrist and forearm driven stroke. And the same is to be held true for fast pizzicato.
And you'll notice, at the slower tempos when you're tone-centered, my finger is almost parallel to the string. The faster the tempo goes, there's this very slight... And you're almost perpendicular to the string at that point. And I'll play with placement for the warmest sound I can get. The, the most harmonically sensitive sound you'll get on the bass is if you're in the middle of the string. But we tend to sacrifice a lot of volume in that situation, so you have to be the judge of what you're going to produce as far as volume versus beautiful tone. And again, you know, if you're... I tend to pull back for warm, and then when I come down, there's more, there's more in the sound, which tends to... That big thump in the sound that a lot of jazz ensembles like to have driving the bottom end of the rhythm section is usually achieved a lot closer to the edge of the board. And again, it's your choice of your angle of attack. Some people are more vertical. I tend to be that way in slow tempos. Some people are at a 45. Some people drop their elbow and are just machine gunning like this from here, which is um, how I tend to approach it. So for me, the big points are one, anchor firmly with the left hand so you get a good sustain to your sound. Two, consider your placement based on the color you want. Three, get as much meat falling through the string down to the board as you can. And then four, the tempo is gonna dictate your angle of attack to the string. And that's going to be very personal for you, depending on I, this is what my hand looks like. I'm sure your hand might be the same or different than that, and you have to make judgment calls based on that. Hopefully this proves helpful. And this is what I've arrived at after a few years of wrestling with this instrument, trying to come to terms with it. Thanks a lot. Okay, right hand stuff. Um, first off, I think it's something you don't have to spend a whole lot of time in the practice room. Um, maybe get some fundamentals together, but you're going to spend so much time on the gig using your right hand. You have plenty of time to practice and you'll learn what works and what doesn't. Um, putting a recorder out front is probably your biggest friend. So let me uh, talk about a couple things. String height is an important one as to how you use your right hand. Um, if you're playing a high string height, you're gonna, most of the guys that do it, which I don't play high string, you're gonna play kind of more down into the finger bar. Which doesn't work too well at my string height. Um, guys that play really low can always play like a bass guitar, I play somewhere in the middle. Um, you've heard a million times, arm weight, all that kind of stuff is very important. Um, to the point where I think this fulcrum, a lot of people use with their thumb, or create with their thumb, is I don't really use it much. Um, I can play completely without a thumb. And that's um, as loud as I can play pretty much without my thumb there and the, all the weight is coming in. You can also use hand muscle, um, which is what you do when you play faster stuff. Um, you can play, you can get just as big a sound, but you're going to tire out quicker. You don't have a lot of endurance that way. So something you tend to use more for solo kind of work. And even then you're going to split it up between which muscle group you're using, depending on what you're doing and where you're getting tired. Um, now on my hand, 
Uh, my callus is run from pretty much where the knuckle meets the finger. Let's see if I can get this like, uh, right about there. It's kind of a, a semi-diagonal up to my fingernail up there on both of those fingers. And then I have a bit of a callus on my knuckle where I, where I tend to uh, hit the, the big string. Because um, I like that. That gets kind of thin. That gets a little more bottom. And, and I think it's all proportion. Everything's all proportion, always. Um, so on the higher strings, I tend, I don't use as much flesh in my finger, but as I go down, I use more and more to where I'm finally using my knuckle like a hook. Um, not all the time, but especially if you're, you know, if you're like really hammering loud at the bottom of the bass, um, that's where I use that a lot. Um, uh, now, proportion back to that, uh, where you are on the fingerboard will determine what kind of sound you get and what parts of your finger you want to use. So, for instance, if you're up here, this would be about G on the D string, um, you can get a kind of nice round horn sound, but you're going to lose some definition, so you want to add a little fingertip in there. Right? Now, if you're down at the end of the fingerboard, bass is pretty punchy like that, so if you use a lot of fingertip, it reach that sort of thing, so you want to use more flesh when you go down there. So it's a balance between what you're doing, also how hard you're pulling. You know, the harder you pull it here, the kind of more fingertip you want to get into it to do that. If you're playing really, really soft, you want to use a whole lot of fingertip there too to offset the lack of projection that you have. And all these, all these sounds are perfectly valid. Um, I see a lot of chat on the internet about getting the sound and the one sound and a certain bass teacher in town puts a piece of Velcro on the neck and that's where you should pull all the time and all that kind of stuff. Um, it doesn't, doesn't strike me as musical because you don't want to speak in a monotone, so why would you play in a monotone? Um, and as far as using all these sounds, you know, it's up to your, your, your ear, what you want to hear, what you've been able to adopt into your vocabulary, right? So if this is a sound that you like, but your playing doesn't have a place for that, you know, that's something you have to get under your ear, and then it will. Um, so, uh, you know, let me give a little bit of a demo about right hand sound production using all these sorts of things. And it's going to be in more of a solo type context, but you can use this in walking or rhythm, not even walking necessarily, but any sort of rhythm section playing. You can use all the stuff, remembering that you're buried further into the band, so things that are too subtle will get lost. Um, so let's, uh, I'll play a little booze. So I think I got a lot of that in there. So left hand. Um, and uh, one more thing I'd like to say is uh, probably the most important thing you can do to make your right hand sound good is to have your left hand together. Um, if you're playing fuzzy with your left hand, laying your fingers flat and not being up where you need to be on the finger, there's very little effect you can have. But you're getting a clear pitch here, then all of a sudden amplifies everything that you could possibly do with your right hand. Um, I think that's enough.
my name is Emma Deha, and I live in Brooklyn, and I play the bass. Um, my, um, my right hand technique has evolved into um, the technique that, that ties these two fingers together um, for the most part. And um, um, when you're playing, you play, um, my fingerboard is kind of hard to see because it's a curved fingerboard. But if this were the line at the end of the fingerboard, you play just above the end of the fingerboard. And you keep this part of your hand curled as much as possible, um, which is actually ends up being a more relaxed position than having them out here, I think. Um, and then um, the goal is to be as even as possible with all your notes. And I find with a lot of basses, um, there's a point at which when you play with more and more volume, there's a point at which the, the bass will start to vibrate more and it'll get louder. And if you keep putting more effort into the string, the bass will choke and actually the sound will get smaller and less attractive to the ears. And so you learn you learn to not overplay whatever instrument you're playing. Um, you get better results that way. And so actually for a long time, um, I practiced playing quietly and the control that it takes to play evenly and quietly across the whole bass was a very good exercise. See, um, and then, then there's the alternating fingers. Um, um, that you can use for for solo purposes and um, faster passages, funk passages, stuff like that. Um, but. Um, they technically those should if you're if you're just practicing um, like in the dark um, you shouldn't be able to tell the difference between the sound of of using both fingers together and using one finger um, and that takes some practice to like to get those notes to sound the same as. ability to make one, either your first finger, your middle finger, or both fingers together to sound the same um, and have consistency and an evenness to them. Um, and, um, and to get each note to ring into the next note. Um, for the most part in modern walking bass lines and in a lot of um, soloistic playing, you don't want to hear like a. You don't want to hear the note stopped before the next note. You want to hear the attack of the next note be the end of the note that happened prior to that. Um, and, um, unless you're going for something stylistically. Um, like his, historical, more historical, um, something along the lines of Milton Hinton or, um, you know, there are certain styles of bass playing that require some space, especially in two fields and stuff where you want to leave, you want to leave space between notes. And then you have to be very aware that that space is in itself a note and how, how to place it. Um, but, um, for like a walking bass line, like what, like what we started the exercise with, we want to probably make that as connected as possible. Um, that's all I can think of for now. Thank you.
Chris Fitzgerald, professor of jazz bass and music theory at the University of Louisville. In this short clip, I'd like to talk about two aspects of right-hand tone production for pizzicato double bass. Um, and I have a slight advantage over the other people in this particular video because uh, I also have several other videos that I can refer to for a more in-depth coverage of the subject. So if you are so inclined, please check out my two uh, videos on right-hand articulation already as part of this series. But in this short clip, I'd like to talk about two things that I think are very important. Um, and I'll start with the first of those. And that is the idea of getting a lot of meat on the string. So you'll see a lot of people play pizzicato, pluck, a lot of different ways. Some people will have their fingers up in this sort of bass guitar plucking position where you play a rest stroke almost like two legs walking. And a lot of great players do that. Uh, I come from the school where I like to get a lot of meat on the string. So the first thing I'll talk about is getting as much flesh on the string as possible and touching the fingerboard before the string is, is struck. So rather than playing in this vertical position, I tend to play in this horizontal position, whether with the first finger or the second finger. Another thing that I think is really important, in addition to getting a lot of flesh on the string, is this idea of touching the fingerboard as much as possible all the way through the stroke. So rather than going up over the string, I like to stay on the fingerboard and just let the string sort of get pulled uh, wherever my finger goes and eventually it will release like a bow and arrow and produce a sound. And that's the same with the first finger or with the second finger, although it's a lot more difficult to get a warm sound with the second finger because it's harder to get as much flesh on the string. So the first thing, lots of flesh on the string, stay on the fingerboard as you complete your stroke. The second thing um, is the idea of velocity of a stroke. So one of the things that I see with and hear with students a lot is a series of quarter notes which sounds a bit like this. So that a walking line would have these little gaps between the notes something like this. So the line doesn't connect. Uh, the line, if it were played in the tradition of uh, Ray Brown or Ray Ron Carter or a number of other great bassists, the line would just be this one beautiful uh, line of connected quarter notes. Obviously, both the right and the left hands have something to do with that, but we'll stay on the open string for now and just focus on what the right hand has to do with that. So if I just play open strings, and my stroke is too slow, the point where my finger comes back to restrike the string actually creates a little bit of deadness or silence between those notes. Whereas if my stroke has a proper velocity to it, if it comes through the string fast enough, the illusion is that the notes all run together in perfect legato. So again, not enough velocity. And then velocity fast enough to connect the notes. And the key to doing this is actually examining the motion that you use um, when you're creating your pitch stroke. So to illustrate this, I'd like to talk about the motion of cracking a lip. If you think about what it's like to crack a lip, you don't just go like this, one big single speed motion. You actually cock your arm back and then you whip it forward and release it. And the easiest way I know of to demonstrate this is to use something like a ruler. And you, you put the ruler by your ear. Be careful not to hit your ear, of course, but 
Put the ruler by your ear, and if you make a single speed motion, it won't make any sound. But if you, if you move the ruler as though you were cracking a whip, when you actually release, there's going to be a whoosh of air. And that motion, that release of stored up energy, is what produces the pit stroke. see it in the motion. It's very slow and then it releases as the arm drops and it comes through the string very quickly to produce a very warm fat sound which is always what I'm going for uh, when playing a walking one. So those are the two things I would have you think about and I'm sure everyone else on the video will give you a lot more to think about. Enjoy!